I just finished a project that aims to measure how fast a hardware adder performs when it's taped out on a silicon chip. And in this video, we're going to look at the design and the build and the testing of this instrumented adder. So let's get started. So what is the adder that we're measuring? Well, we've got a few different types thanks to the work that Teo's done. So if you haven't seen the live stream or the edited live stream, then check out the link on the slides. The link for all the material is going to be in the video description. One very interesting data point that he presented in his slides was the number of times an adder is used while booting Linux. And you can see from this that it's very important to have fast adders. But sometimes we don't need a fast adder, we want a slower adder that uses less area or less power. So it would be nice if we could choose what type of adder actually got put on the silicon. So he designed a Yosis plugin and a Python script that can generate these different types of adders. And we thought it would be a good idea to take them all out, all the different types on MPW6, and along with some circuitry to measure how fast they are. And you can see in this table, which is just for the 8-bit adders, that we get different types of densities and different types of maximum frequencies. So we want to be able to choose which one of these we want to use. So how do we go about measuring how fast an adder is when it's on the chip? Now, if you've seen the video series that I did with Andrew Zonenberg about measuring how performant open SRAM is, then we had a bunch of problems with that because there wasn't any instrumentation built around the open RAM and we had to just measure the actual inputs and outputs from the chip. And the problem is there, there's lots of things you don't know, like the exact length of the wires or the capacitance or the uh, other types of parasitics that you can get. And so it's impossible to get a really precise reading. So what you really need to do is put something that's right next to the hardware that you want to measure on the chip. Now I got some great advice from the Zero to ASIC course community and I was given two different options to try. Harder but more accurate is razor flops and so I chose the very easy way which is to use tri-state buffers because in my experience doing anything with ASIC takes longer than you expect so I thought let's go with the easy one and I'm glad I did because it still took longer than I expected. So I'll show how that works in the subsequent slides. But one of the other things to note is we're not just going to get information about these adders and how well they match the predicted simulation parameters, but also we're going to be able to feed this information back into the PDK and the open source tools, and that will hopefully improve things going forwards in the future. So let's take a look at how you could do this with a ring oscillator. So a ring oscillator is an odd number of inverters all looped together into a big loop, and the, the ring oscillates at a certain frequency because each of the inverters has a very small amount of time it takes to propagate the signal across it. By choosing the number of inverters that you have, you can choose the frequency of the loop. So the idea is that we have this ring oscillator here, and with this MUX we can either take the input of the ring and pass it through, or we pass it through the adder and then take that. And we control the other side of the adder, the B input of the adder, with the logic analyzer from Caravel. And we have this XOR here in case as we pass through the adder, it doesn't invert the signal because we need to make sure that it acts like an inverter to keep the ring oscillating. So if that doesn't happen, we have this XOR here that we can drive and that will make sure that we can add an extra inverter if we need to. So that was my very simple attempt at getting something started, but it soon appeared we we're gonna to need to add more stuff. So with some more help from the Zero to ASIC course community, we came up with this. So we've got stuff in blue is inputs, uh, stuff in green is just net names to make it easier to refer to the design, and then red is outputs. So now we've got our ring oscillator loop here. With a bypass control, we can just make it oscillate here. With the control loop, we can add these extra four inverters, and that should teach us a couple of things. The first is that it will confirm that adding these four extra inverters actually does slow the loop down and will result in a lower count. And the other thing is it will help us to determine the resolution of the measurement and set the units of the measurement. And then we've got a way of um, sending the ring through any one of the bits through the adder and then back out. And we can also override that externally. And we've got full control of the B input and the sum output goes out. So using those things, we can also verify that the adder actually works. So by setting this up, we've got these three different options for the ring. And then we can count here how fast it's oscillating. 
and we have an integration counter. So we preload that with some number. This counts down as it's counting down. This is allowed to count up. And then once this finishes, we'll get an output here. So if we say have a 10 megahertz clock and we set this to 10 million, then after this is counted down, 10 million will get some number in here. And then by dividing one by the other, we'll know what the frequency of the loop is. Then we can enable the adder one bit at a time through the adder and that will allow us to characterize how fast the adder is. So let's take a look at the Verilog and how we built this. I took some inspiration from an old project from Claire Wolf with um, instantiating the inverters uh, in a nice array format, which is pretty, pretty sweet. You can check the source on GitHub here to look at the whole source. And one thing that we did was made it so that the modules that are instantiated are these um, this inverter with a delay. So if I'm doing a CocoTB simulation, I can make it so it, it takes a specific amount of time for that inverter to respond. So I can kind of force a fake value for the delay of an inverter. And that helps me just prove that the ring oscillator is working. But when the, then when we actually synthesize it for the ASIC, we put in a specific standard cell, a double dive, drive strength inverter. And we did a very similar thing with the tri-state buffers. So once we had the basic Verilog in place, I was starting to implement testing, which I like to do with CocoTB. So we have five or six different tests that check the basic setup and make sure the ring oscillates, make sure that the counters work, this kind of thing. And you can see here, we've got actually five different tests running. And let's just take a look at these uh, one, two, three. So these are for uh, the control, the bypass loop where the, the ring oscillator counter counts up the highest because it's the ring is oscillating the fastest. Uh, then with the, um, the control loop, which adds another four inverters, so it counts a bit slower. And then finally with an adder, which counts, which adds the biggest delay to the loop. And so we get the, this lowest amount here. And then this last part of the test is doing a, a constrained random uh, test to check that the adder is actually working. Now, when this gets taped out on MBW6, uh, it will be inside the Caravel harness provided by eFabless. And so we've got a CPU, RISC-V CPU and a logic analyzer, and that's what's gonna be setting up all the configuration. So our design goes in here and it gets configured through this log logic analyzer. So I also wanted to write some C code, which you can see here, which basically does the same thing as the CocoDB tests. And then I can just check that the output is the same. Because we've got all these loops that we can enable and they're all done with these tri-state buffers, we wanted to have a bit of code that would prevent uh, more than one operating at a time. So a kind of inverted one hot because actually we're driving the signals low to enable them, they're inverted. So Yanis from Yosis HQ helped me out with this uh, nice little bit of code here. And then we also using the new tri-state support in SBY, the Yosis HQ formal verification tool, we were able to prove that that works. One thing that was quite exciting for me was that this is probably my first mixed signal project for ASIC. Normally my projects are all digital. And because this one has a ring oscillator, it's kind of a mixed signal. So I wanted to use the analog modeling tools to check that the loop was gonna actually oscillate and what frequency it was gonna oscillate at and the rise time and stuff like this. So um, you can see here, we've got the bypass loop and the adder loop. And you should be able to see that the bypass loop is oscillating faster than the adder loop. So that was a way of proving that that was gonna work and also measuring how fast it was gonna oscillate. And in the end, we used 31 inverters to get a predicted oscillation time of 250 megahertz. I learned a lot of stuff. So uh, to start with, my simulations never converged. They just took a long time and then crashed because the inputs were floating. Um, I needed to add UIC to the dot transient simulation and that avoids spending a lot of time working out initial conditions that I didn't care about. And finally, a really important thing was using the special dot spice init setup for Sky 130 and that dropped the simulation time from 50 minutes to two and a half minutes. And I also learned some cool automatic measuring tools from NG Spice to measure ring oscillation frequency and rise time. The 8-bit version of the adders, we could do the simulation in a few minutes, but unfortunately when I did the 32-bit version, which added 5 times 32 uh, flip-flops into the design, that made it a lot harder for NG Spice, and now uh, things take a few days to do the same simulation. 
I got some help from the Zero to Asic course community to help me do corner simulations. So if you want to know more about corners, then check out the terminology here. But this is basically making sure that as temperature changes and depending on the uh, process variations, that the design is still going to work within expected parameters. So this is showing that uh, the kind of range of frequencies that we would expect maybe across the minimum and maximum performance of any given wafer. And then this is showing us how uh, stable things are in terms of uh, temperature versus the frequency of the loop. Moving on to hardening with open lane, there wasn't really a problem here. I had a little bit of a problem when I went to the 32-bit version. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we met 100 megahertz clock frequency and uh, that's just for the, the counters involved in the design. I did want to try to get a timing parameter on the actual ring oscillator loop, but I just couldn't get that to work with OpenSTA. I tried splitting the module into two parts and having uh, using a kind of second clock port, which was actually the ring oscillator uh, in the STF file, sorry, the STC file, but the OpenSTA could never find the clock port. So in the end, I gave up on that. After we'd hardened the design with open lane, Maximo was able to open the design with the open road GUI and trace out some of these important nets for us. So we can see here, for example, the inverter chain that's here, uh, the bypass and control loops here, and then uh, this complicated section here is uh, up this bit here. So very interesting to see how that actually gets laid out inside the design. And when we do the measurements, we'll need to take into account these longer metal traces and how they'll slow down the signal compared to this short inverter loop here. Then maybe uh, five days before tape out, uh, we thought that we should probably extend from an 8-bit adder, parameterize it and go to a 32-bit adder in case an 8-bit adder was too fast to measure, wouldn't make enough of a difference which then involved uh, multiplexing the logic analyzer control pins because now all of these inputs needed to be 32 bit wide. So we had to add um, five times 32 flip flops that made things a bit bigger. We also added a force flag to force the ring oscillator to count even without the integration counter working. And we also put some of the pins out onto the output pins of the ASIC. So if stuff went wrong with the control CPU, we'd still be able to get some useful results with a logic analyzer or a oscilloscope. And finally, we needed to reharden with the context of the group project. So that's the zero to ASIC group submission for MPW6. The size went up to 370 microns squared. Uh, we had a lot of extra routing for all the logic analyzer control channels. And we had these five different ones, one for the behavioral, default Yosis um, adder, and then the four different ones uh, provided by Teo. Uh, that reduced the Fmax to 50 megahertz. Um, you can see it needed quite a lot more routing, so I had to twiddle around a bit with the config to get that all to work, but it really wasn't that difficult to get that in. And that was all successfully submitted for the June the 8th uh, submission deadline. We don't know if the project's been accepted yet, but everything is ready to go. And finally, I just want to say thanks to everyone who helped me with this project. It wouldn't have been possible without you. And it was really cool to be doing an open source ASIC project with contributions from people all around the world. And if you want to learn how to make your own chips, then why not find out more about the Zero to ASIC course, check the website, sign up to the newsletter, and hopefully see you on there soon.